Hello everyone, I'm Jan van Roestel. I'm a postdoc here at Caltech, where I work with the Zwicky transient facility to study um, all kinds of variable stars. And I'd like to talk about uh, cataclysmic variable stars uh, here, uh, giving an introduction on, on a typical example and discussing some more exotic variants uh, at the end of my talk. So before talking about cataclysmic variable stars, I'd like to introduce or reintroduce the rush potential. The rush potential is the gravitational potential in the co-rotating co frame of a binary star. And um, the so-called rush lobe is the area of space where uh, one star, um, the gravity of one star uh, dominates and particles within that rush lobe um, uh, can't escape. However, if, you, if your star exceeds uh, the size of the Roche lobe, it will start to lose material. And it will first uh, start to lose material towards the other star, which is shown here uh, on the right. Uh, what will, how this process will exactly happen uh, varies on, on the nature of, the, of both stars. And we'll see a few examples later. So what is a cataclysmic variable star? And I'll give an a uh, typical example here, uh, of course, you've got a white dwarf star, which have been introduced already by other speakers. Um, and you've got the secondary star, the donor star, which is for a typical examples is, is like a low mass main sequence star. And uh, this donor star is, uh, slow, is, is overfilling its rush lobe, so it's slowly losing material uh, to the white dwarf star, and it will and it's doing this via via a accretion stream, and because of angular momentum conservation, uh, this accretion stream won't impact the white dwarf directly, but it will form an accretion disk, shown here on the right. Um, just to give you a sense of uh, the size of these objects, uh, the semi-major axis is typically 0.5 to 2 solar radii, with orbital periods of 80 minutes to about 6 hours, although they can go up to 12 hours. So the first question is, how can you make a cataclysmic variable star? So you start out with two main sequence stars in an orbital period of typically 2000 days or less. Um, and um, as you probably know, um, the more massive star evolves uh, quickest. So at some point it will become a red giant star and then an AGB uh, giant star. And uh, at these points, the this more massive star will uh, dramatically increase in size. And, and uh, because of that, it will exceed uh, its rush load. So material will start to flow to the secondary star. Uh, because the process here involves a transfer of material from a high mass star to a low mass star, this uh, process is uh, unstable. And you get, uh, what you basically get is once the, the red giant engulfs uh, the secondary star. So you now have this giant uh, atmosphere, the giant star atmosphere, the, the envelope or the common envelope as it's called, uh, engulfing both the core of the red giant, which will become the white dwarf star and this secondary star. And they, these two objects are still rotating inside this giant uh, star atmosphere. So you can get two outcomes, either they will merge together, or if there's an, enough angular momentum in the orbit of the two stars, the envelope will, will get expelled and um, a short period white dwarf uh, red dwarf um, binary will remain. The orbital period is typically uh, a, few, a few hours to, to a few days. So what will happen now is um, these systems will slowly lose uh, angular momentum um, in by, by two mechanisms. The first is magnetic breaking, which is interaction of particles with uh, the magnetic fields of, of the star, sorry, stellar wind, particles in stellar wind. And the second method are gravitational waves. And as this cartoon shows that um, now we've got the orbital separation slowly decreasing due to angular momentum loss. And what will happen at some point is that the secondary star, the, the, the red dwarf star, will become too large to fit inside its rush lobe. And we again have um, uh, rush lobe overflow. 
In this case, uh, we're transferring material from a low mass star to a higher mass white dwarf star, and this process is stable, and this is a cataclysmic variable. So th this uh, explains how cataclysmic variable stars formed, but um, how do they actually evolve um, as a cataclysmic variable star? So they typically, uh, when accretion starts at the orbital period at which accretion starts depends on the size of the of the donor star. Um, it's typically six hours, but can also be at shorter orbital periods. Um, but what you get is that uh, initially the accretion rate will be large, and uh, the donor star will um, keep on losing ma mass because angular momentum is still continuously being removed from the binary system. And this will um, basically uh, cause uh, the system to shrink. Um, because you, as you remember, uh, the donor has to be, um, will be kept in contact and will keep on filling his cross lobe. And because uh, a main sequence star shrinks if it loses mass. However, at the very end, you can see this uh, bend in the curve and it will actually, the process will refer reverse. This is because brown dwarfs actually increase in size if they lose mass. And uh, the result uh, of angular momentum loss coupled with mass transfer will actually result in a widening of the binary again here at the very end. If you want to know uh, what causes this plateau, I recommend you read uh, the very uh, detailed description of cataclysmic variable evolution by Christian Kniege. So what happens to all this material that's being transferred to the white dwarf? Well, this initially it will stay inert, it will slowly pile up on top of the white dwarf. Um, however, there will be a point when the density and temperature will be too high. Uh, and Term, um, and nuclear fusion will commence. And this results in um, a uh, thermonuclear explosion known as a nova. And of course, I can't fail to mention RS Ofuyuki, which uh, is a recent nova, which uh, uh, outbursted, outbursted on August 8th. And you can actually see it by eye if you uh, look up the sky uh, from a dark, uh, dark location. And this is actually an example of a recurring nova. So this one uh, had a, has an outburst typically every 15 years. So the last one was in 2006. But you can have, depending on the mass transfer rate, you can have various uh, recurrence times. There's one uh, known which outbursts every year in M31, while there are also nova which uh, have only been seen to outburst once. So, um, besides uh, thermonuclear explosions and NOVA, there are also another type of variability for which cataclysmic variable stars are most, most famous for and actually named after. And to understand these more uh, subtle uh, um, or slightly more subtle um, outbursts, we first need to understand um, the accretion disk and mass transfer. So. Uh, it's important to understand that um, the accretion rate on, onto the white dwarf is determined by uh, the accretion disk. And in the accretion disk, angular momentum has to be transport out, transported out from the inner part of the disk to the outer part of the disk. And this, only this allows material to flow on top of the white dwarf. So angular momentum transport uh, is done by viscosity in the disk. And um, um, and this sets the mass accretion rate onto the white dwarf. However, as you remember, uh, the accretion flow from the donor star is set by the angular momentum loss in the binary system. And um, these two ha don't have to be uh, the same. And if hydrogen is neutral, actually viscosity is low. So this means that uh, the accretion rate onto the white dwarf is low. So you can kind of think as think think of the disk as a reservoir, which is getting slowly filled up until it uh, gets until it's full, and um, something happens. Then uh, the temperature and density of the disk increase uh, to such high values that you uh, ionize the hydrogen, and this uh, ionization suddenly causes the um, viscosity to uh, um, 
uh, become uh, a lot higher, which results in the accretion rate to become higher, which results in the temperature to become higher. And it basically ionize, suddenly ionizes the entire uh, entire disk. So it becomes uh, becomes a lot hotter and a lot brighter. And it very rapidly um, it's, is emptied out on top of the white dwarf. So this uh, sudden state change uh, results in a, in a sudden uh, change in temperature and therefore a change in brightness. And we can actually see that uh, a lot in the ZTF data. So um, an event like this is called a dwarf novae outburst. Uh, it's a dwarf novae because it's not as extreme as a novae. It's typically five magnitudes. It can be a bit lower or a bit uh, higher. Um, but these are very common in uh, cataclysmic variable stars. And on the left, you see an example of a, of a very frequent dwarf novae outburst, like almost every month. While on the right, you see a system which only shows, uh, uh, shows outbursts uh, once every few years. And just to give you an idea of how many there are, we're seeing thousands of these things in the ZTF data. Uh, we typically find uh, a few tens of them each night. Um, and they're all shown here. So there's a few papers out trying to uh, um, trying to identify all uh, known and new systems in the ZTF data by Paul Ascoli, if you want to have a look. So now I'm going to discuss some more uh, exotic um, types of uh, CVs. And I'm not going to discuss all of them. I just want to highlight a, very, a few interesting objects. And in this case, uh, what happens if you add strong white dwarfs to the uh, strong uh, magnetic fields to the white dwarf? Um, this can cause the accretion flow to be disrupted. And actually, um, the disk, uh, as it uh, or the material as it flows through the disk, will uh, be diverted by the mag magnetic fields, and it will be diverted on top uh, of the north and south pole of the white dwarf. And this can, uh, of course, uh, uh, can, can look uh, uh, very exotic in both spectra and light curves. Even more uh, exotic example is uh, so-called uh, propeller. And uh, this is the second one uh, um, discovered. It was actually discovered last year, uh, where the magnetic fields actually propel the material um, from the accretion flow even further outwards and completely ejects it from the system. Right, I'd like to finish uh, with uh, another type of uh, cataclysmic variable stars, which are the so-called AMCVN systems, which is uh, something I've been working on with ZTF. A AMCVN systems are, again, accreting white dwarfs, but now the donor star is not a main sequence star, but some uh, degenerate, low mass degenerate object. So this is uh, either uh, the remnant of a white dwarf or the remnant of a helium star. And uh, uh, some of the properties are is that there's no hydrogen in, this, in these systems whatsoever. This has been completely lost in the, in the formation uh, of these systems. And because, uh, as you remember, um, the orbital period is such that the donor star is, um, is, uh, in con is, is, is always filling its rush lobe, you can have orbital periods as short as five minutes uh, up to 60 minutes. Uh, these sources, because of their short orbital periods, are strong gravitational wave sources. And I'm referring to the talk by Kevin Birch on double white dwarfs on more information uh, about, uh, about these uh, objects, gravitational wave um, sources. And just to give you an idea of how many there are, there's like we've seen thousands, tens of thousands of um, CVs in the ZTF data stream, but they're only um, after a lot of work for the last 35 years, only 70 of these AMCVN systems known in the galaxy. And just to show you how, what the spectra look like. So on top, you've got a typical CV, which has hydrogen emission lines and sometimes a little, little bit of helium emission. While these AMCVN systems only show helium emission lines um, and no hydrogen whatsoever. So spectroscopically, they're very, easy to identify. However, um, oh, sorry, first, uh, the evolution of these systems. So as you can imagine, um, 
these objects uh, have a lot more uh, complicated uh, formation uh, channels, um, but there's like two two main channels where you either get um, um, get a, get uh, a white dwarf with another white dwarf as a donor, or you have a white dwarf with a helium star as a donor. And there's also a, actually a third channel, which is which is um, the channel where you have a CV with uh, with an evolved uh, donor. So it's a main sequence star, which is not on the on the just kind of left them just has, has just left the main sequence, but uh, hasn't become a red giant uh, yet. So as you can see on the right, um, these objects uh, first um, start out as very short period detached system. So the double white dwarfs, uh, Kevin mentioned. And at, at the point they start accreting, because these are degenerate objects, the donors will actually increase in size. And if you've, you've seen before with the brown dwarfs, uh, if an object uh, increases in size, this has to mean that the orbital period increases. And that's what we're uh, seeing in, in, in most of these cases where uh, AMCVN systems uh, um, go from short periods to long periods except for the initial phases. So as I was about to say uh, earlier, these systems basically look the same in the CTF data. They um, also have an accretion disk, um, uh, although the accretion disk is now fully helium and no hydrogen, you basically get the same process where you've got, um, you've got neutral uh, helium versus ionized helium. And this causes basically the same pattern with these outbursts of a few uh, um, magnitudes, which can recur on time scales of a few, we a few weeks to months to, to years or tens of years even. Um, so unfortunately, these uh, they basically look the same in CTF light curves. We recently tried to make the distinction between the hydrogen CVs and the helium CVs, the AMCVN systems by looking at their quiescence color, and that was uh, relatively successful. You can read about it in my paper from earlier this year. Um, but we also uh, tried a different method where we looked at CVs, which also show eclipses. And if you look on the left, you see uh, the ZTF light curve with uh, a few outbursts, a few CV outbursts, but you also see a lot of low, low points here uh, where the system seems to, be, seems to disappear. While this is, of course, uh, can also happen for a regular CV where um, where the donor star moves in front of uh, in front of the white dwarf and the system gets fainter. However, because of these eclipses, we could uh, we were able to determine what the orbital period is, and uh, this is actually uh, only requires uh, CTF data. You just need to find the eclipses and and just basically check. Uh, what period do I need to line up the eclipses? And if you find something uh, shorter than 60 minutes, you know it's, a, it's actually a, an eclipsing AMCVN system. So using this method, I actually found five of these systems. Um, and the other reason why these are interesting besides they're easy to identify with only CTF data, CTF light curve data, is that if you get high speed photometry of these eclipses, you can uh, basically solve the entire system. Um, you don't actually need any additional information. You just need a very precise, uh, precise light curves uh, to measure the mass of the white dwarf, the mass of the donor, and the size of the donor and the inclination of the system. Uh, so how how to do that um, requires some complicated models, which also include the disk and the and the bright spot. But if you do that, you can measure uh, all these properties. And uh, the reason why we want to do this is because we want to answer the question, which of the formation channels is more important? So if you remember the two slides, two of the previous slides is that there are multiple ways to, multiple proposed ways to make these AMCVN systems. You either have a white dwarf with another white dwarf, a white dwarf with a helium star, or even the most the least likely scenario is a white dwarf with an evolved um, evolved main sequence star as a donor and we don't know which of these channels is more important so by measuring by modeling the light curves and measuring all these properties of these five new systems we were able to determine um, that um, 
uh, the, the, the most likely formation channel is actually the helium star formation channel. If you want to read more about this, you can uh, see my uh, more recent paper uh, published on these objects. Right, so that's a, a crash course in cataclysmic variable variable stars and some highlights from uh, from ZTF and some uh, um, current uh, well the, the cutting edge science of CVs. If you want to ask me more questions about CVs, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, contact me at uh, at the email address shown here. Thank you.